And let me introduce to you a very courageous man, a very patriotic man, a man who believes in truth and integrity, and he absolutely lives it. And he is my dear, dear friend, Brandon Darby. Brandon. How many of you were here last night? Awesome, how many of you weren't here last night? Okay, that's better, that's great. I'm happy that more people are hearing this. Um, you know, I've been here before and I've talked with you all and I've, I've come and I've talked about human trafficking, I've talked about, I, we kind of have a process for trying to get information out. When we know there's a problem, we write about it and then we start to do grassroots tours, we travel around and just, try to make it personal to everyone, answer questions, and make sure everyone knows what's going on. About the last year and a half, actually a little longer, it's pushing two years, but about the last year and a half, uh, Breitbart has enabled me to spend a great deal of my time on the border. And when I say on the border, I mean all the way from, from the Gulf of Mexico all the way to the Pacific Ocean. There's only one little stretch that I haven't seen uh, and that's, that would be most of the Big Bend sector. But uh, maybe some of you know this, some of you don't. There are nine border patrol sectors along the southwest border with Mexico. Um, you frequently hear that the border is wide open. And then how many of you felt relieved when Perry and, and Abbott and everyone got on TV and said that they were sending a thousand National Guard members to the border? Did anybody here feel relieved? Did anybody here think that that was actually what was occurring? They are sending a thousand National Guard members to the border. Um, but as, you, as you're going to see in this little film that we're going to show you, uh, that's not really sufficient and they're not actually doing what they said they're doing. They are doing what they said they're doing technically, but it's a technical issue. And you'll understand that a little more after this video and after I talk to you. So. We put together a tour. Uh, we brought some grassroots leaders from the state together. We all met in San Antonio and then got a van and drove to the border. And I wanted to show people what exactly was happening on the border. Um, the Rio Grande Valley sector, how many of you have ever heard of the Rio Grande Valley sector? You've heard of that? How many of you have not heard that before? Anyone? No one's going to raise their hand. I know a couple of people did. So basically the way, I wish I had like a map and a laser and, and stuff to point out, but basically the way it's set up is the Rio Grande Valley sector is a quarter of Texas border with Mexico. It's just a quarter of the Texas border, right? It's one sector. That's where the majority of the unaccompanied minors are coming through, but it isn't where the majority of narcotics, um, cartel members, sex offenders, uh, previously convicted sex offenders and murderers are coming through. Um, and it isn't even necessarily where the majority of, of, of uh, illegal aliens who are coming here to work are coming through. Because there is a difference, you know, there are illegal aliens who come here to work. We all probably have met them or seen them or used, many people use them in their yards um, or for other work if you have a construction company. Uh, and obviously those, not everyone who comes across is coming across to commit sex offenses. But the fact of the matter is, is a lot of people do um, come across to do that. For instance, we broke on Breitbart News, I was proud to say, that in the last three years, there have been over 7,000, listen to this, over 7,000 previously convicted sex offenders who have been deported from the state of Texas alone, just from the state of Texas. Did y'all know that? 7,000, over 7,000. It's actually closer to probably 8,000 now. And that, that mostly happened in Eagle Pass, which is in the Del Rio sector, which is two sectors over. Um, they've seen a 100% increase in the last few months in previously convicted sex offenders coming across the border. And a lot of that is attributed to the way that the Obama administration, how many of you have heard this? How many of you have heard that, that Obama has deported more people than anyone else? Have you heard that? Okay, let me tell you a little secret. That's not true. And let, let me, no, I'll give you the details of it. Let me tell you the details. The details are this. When people come across the border, they're asked if they'll go back, basically. Voluntary, um, what's it called? Voluntary removals. And they're asked if they'll go back. That is not, like during the Bush administration, that is not considered a deportation. Okay? Now, 
in the Obama, under the Obama administration, everyone who voluntarily goes back is called a deportation. And so not only are they called a deportation, but there's no punishment if you come across and they catch you and they let you voluntarily go back. Well, when you come across the next day and they catch you again and they let you voluntarily go back, there's no punishment for that, right? So where it used to be that illegal aliens would receive a penalty for illegal reentry after deportation, that doesn't really happen much anymore. So when you see these high numbers, a lot of them are the same people and it's stuff that generally is not considered a deportation. We all, we're following each other, right? Okay, so we're gonna talk about a little bit about the Rio Grande Valley sector. And then we're gonna talk about the Laredo sector, which is one sector over. I told you that there's nine sectors along the US-Mexico border, right? Now there are five of those sectors in Texas. You have the Rio Grande Valley sector, then you have the Laredo sector, then the Del Rio sector, then it goes on to the Big Bend sector, then it goes on to the El Paso sector, five. So, when Perry and everyone got on TV and said that they are securing the border because the federal government can't or won't, and they're sending a thousand troop members to the border, they were, they're sending a thousand members to the Rio Grande Valley sector, okay? That's not the sector right over. So we decided what we would do is get this grassroots group together and we're gonna deal with the Laredo sector. And once we get the Laredo sector in everyone's mind and they understand that it's wide open, then we're gonna go on to the Del Rio sector. You see how this, you see what I'm talking about? We're just gonna go down the border and keep raising awareness. So we got the groups together and we put together a short little video. It's not superbly edited, it's just a short little video of, of that trip and what we learned. And at this point, we're gonna watch that. Joanne? I'm ready for the video. Okay, uh, are y'all ready for the video? It's gonna be a minute. We are, it's gonna be a minute. We have to keep it fresh, so. I can keep talking, don't worry. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you guys will just wait back there, Brandon will pick up on that wave. Yeah, so we're gonna wait for the video because of computer problems. It's been a troubled video. It had problem, we had problems with the video and, uh, when we spoke in Dallas, too. Um, okay, so. We're gonna skip the video for now. We'll get flag me when it's ready. Here's what we did. And this is one of the things that makes, I think our reporting, I'm very proud of our reporting at Bright Bar Texas on the border. And here's why. We've spent so much time down there, and I've spent so much time down there, primarily alone, that these border patrol agents run into me in the middle of nowhere. You know, they're not used to running into anyone who's a U.S. citizen way out where they run into me. And they run into me and they're like, what are you doing out here? And I'm like, well, I'm trying to figure out what's going on out here and then I'm going to go tell the world what's happening here. And so they start talking to me and I give them my card. Well, so when that agent has a story he wants to tell, do you think he calls CNN who trashes him constantly? Huh? No, who are they? They're going to remember me, right? Because it was a person-to-person -person relationship, you know? I can write on Breitbart, Texas all day long what's going on in the Laredo sector and on the border, but if I come here in front of you and talk to you and let you ask me questions and I interact with you, it's going to matter more to you because you understand it more, right? See how that works? So that's what we've done. And we've just systematically gone from, literally, from the Gulf of Mexico all the way to, to California and all the way through California and then to Arizona and then back to Arizona and back to California and just systematically have gone across the border talking to Border Patrol agents. How many of you realize that they are not allowed to talk to media? You know that? How many of you don't realize that federal agents can't just tell media what's going on? They can. You know, I know more of you want to raise your hand. It's okay. I know it's embarrassing to raise your, be the only ones raising your hand. <clears throat> Do I take that that the video is ready? Is that what that means? It sounded like sounded like windows or something <laughs> alert mess so here's the deal on the border we have systematically gone back and forth talked to every agent who would talk to us off the record we found out that there's a border patrol union and union sounds so bad i know we're like we don't like unions but here's the deal if it weren't for the border patrol agents union and by the way most of them are conservatives you can imagine why they might not like the president right now as, a, as people um, their union, if it weren't for the union, they would not have any mechanism to tell the country what's going on. 
So what we're seeing now is that the union began to tell us what was going on and what the agents were going through, and then we began to see the administration come in and crash down upon the union. And so again, the Obama administration, who's pro-union, is very anti-Border Patrol union. Even though the union is an AFL-CIO union. Isn't that strange how that works? So they began to crash down upon them for telling us information that we then told the public. And we rely on a number of anonymous, um, not anonymous, but what would we call it, um, unnamed sources. We keep leaking documents that are internal intelligence reports. We leaked a document that showed that more than 75 nations had members coming across, had people, citizens coming across the Southwest US border. 75 nations. The three nations most affected by Ebola, we leaked that because of someone in the Border Patrol that leaked us information. Uh, we had the official intelligence reports. We also leaked that out of all of these kids that are coming across, these little babies, well, it turns out 47% of them are not little babies at all. 47% of them are males who claim to be between the ages of 15 and 17. And when I say claim to be, that's because they may be 18, they may be 19 or 20 and look young. We don't really know. We have no way to verify it. However, they will be in public school with your kids this year in Texas. And um, if you think that 17 in Mexico and Honduras and El Salvador is the same thing as 17 here, you're wrong. It isn't. Not at all. And they're going to be in school with your kids or your grandkids. Some of you may be great grandkids. I'm not trying to presume anything. Um, and that's what we're going to go through. So anyways, we systematically go down the border and we find all of the holes. Like we were in the Laredo sector, in the city of Laredo, right? And I'm out there and this Border Patrol agent said, if you want to see something, you ought to go look at these drainage tunnels. And I'm like, what's up with the drainage tunnels? And they said, well, these drainage tunnels that go down to the river, we're not allowed to go in there and the illegal aliens and the drug smugglers know it. And I'm like, so what do you mean? They said, well, go look at them. There's ladders, there's everything, there's clothes, there's stuff in there for them. And so when we see a smuggler with narcotics or a group of illegal aliens, we chase them, they run into the drainage tunnel, and we're not allowed to go in there after them. They have to call the fire department, and then the fire department never shows up. And it's like, okay, so there's basically just like an amnesty highway from the river up into the city. They're like, that's right, now go look at the other end of that tunnel. So I, being myself, went into the tunnel, right? And I was going through the tunnel with my camera, and my little night vision camera, until I saw bats in the tunnel. And I was like, I'm sorry, people. I can't do it. But anyways, I, I was able to determine that the tunnel starts at the river and that there's entry points to the tunnel all along the way and then the tunnel ends up in a neighborhood that's known for narcotic smuggling. Isn't that something? Yeah. And so we were able to bring that little secret to the American public and say, look at these drug tunnels, look what's going on here. And that's what we systematically do. When we went to Arizona, we found that in the mountainous regions, there are these groups of people who sit up on the mountaintops, not exactly on the tops, but close to the top, and they hide, and they're actually scouts for the cartels. They're scouts. Some of these happen 20 miles into the U.S. territory, into the United States of America. One rancher, a guy named Bevan Oliphant, he has several mountains. I don't own a mountain. How many of you can imagine owning a mountain? I don't. But he has several mountains on his ranch that he owns, his own mountains. And on top of one of the mountains, they found an antenna that was concreted in. And it was a relay station for the cartels because they sit up there and they scout and they say, okay, the law enforcement's over there, there's people over this way, bring your shipment to the left. Bring your shipment up this way, bring your shipment up that way. So when the border patrol finally got to the top of the mountain to bust these people, one of them was a US citizen and the other was an illegal alien. And they were up there and it turns out what happens is that the Mexican cartels send smugglers with batteries on their back, big battery packs. And every day there's smugglers who go to these relay stations. Did y'all know this? You ever heard of this before? Isn't that infuriating and insane? So when you go out in the mountains in Arizona and you set your, your radio to scan, you can hear the people, the, the, the scouts talking about you, whether you're a threat or not, to avoid you, you can hear them. That's how frustrating it is. Uh, two weeks ago, a week and a half ago, I went out to where Brian Terry was killed. It literally took me six hours to get to where he was killed. Um, it wasn't easy to get there. It was a, it was a remote area. Um, 
which is actually only like three miles from a neighborhood, but it's because of the mountains. It's really, you know, it's pretty hot out there, about 110, and it, it, going up, how many of you have ever hiked like vertically? Not easy when you're in Arizona and you worry about snakes and it's that season where they don't rattle and you know, pretty creepy. But there's also these people out there and it was the people who killed Brian Terry actually. That group was composed of illegal aliens and it was composed of some US citizens and they were what's called a rip crew. How many of you have ever heard of a rip crew? Check this out. There are people who go out to these regions for the purpose of robbing drug shipments. That's some bad boys right there, right? Like it's bad to rob a 7-Eleven, but it's, you gotta be real bad to go rob a drug, a drug smuggler for a cartel. And that happens on US soil. So when Brian Terry was killed, Border Patrol agent Brian Terry, they were trying to interdict this group, this RIP crew, who was out there just to, to bust a drug, ship, or to, to steal a drug shipment. They were armed men with AK-47s on US soil, some of them illegal aliens, walking through our land and they killed our law enforcement officer, you know? And there's a memorial out there for him. And so you find these little holes and you find these little things. Robert Rosas Jr., have you ever heard that name before? I'll tell you, Robert Rosas Jr. was a Border Patrol agent in California. And uh, I'm gonna, I have to tell the story, and then we'll, I'll tell it in the dark, whatever, whatever. Robert Rosas Jr. was a Border Patrol agent in California. A sensor was set off along the border and he was sent out alone to check on the sensor. So when he got out there alone to check on that sensor, it turns out it was a trap. Five illegal aliens had lured him. They attacked him. He shot one of them two times, but they still attacked him. They ended up killing him. Between their bare hands and his gun, they killed him dead right there on a ridge about maybe 40 yards, 50 yards from the border fence, which is about it's a fence that looks like the fence around a junkyard, just a metal, sheet metal fence. There's no, no security there. And they killed him and they took his night vision equipment. And when I went out there to honor him and to see where he was killed, I stood on the ridge where he was killed and I was looking through a viewfinder of my camera, right? And I'm out there looking and I get to this huge cross. It's like 15 feet, 12 feet high. And it has a big plaque on it with his name up high. And I'm looking through my viewfinder and when I look down, there was this sheet of laminated paper and it was, it was like going in the wind, bent over. It was really windy out there and I couldn't see it. So I'm looking through my viewfinder and I take one of my hands and I moved it over. And it said, I think it said, we either we love you, Papa, or we miss you, Papa. And it was a picture of him and his little kid. So you can see where the, 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 the fire comes from to, to tell these guys stories on the border, the border patrol agents, to tell their stories and to tell what they go through. Uh, with that, is that video ready now? Awesome. We're going to watch the video and then we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit longer and then do a Q&A. Thank you. This would make a good um, one of the a good commercial for you know DSO or something. So why don't we do this? Why don't we push pause and let it build up for a while in the system? And we'll 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 keep talking. How's that sound? Okay, awesome. Alright guys, so we're gonna have a hard time with this video today. We might get to the video, we might not. But either way, I'll tell you what's going on in the video. Um, I'll wait a few more minutes to do that. So I, I don't want to ruin the video for you. Uh, what's that? I, you know, it's fine with me. I don't yeah. mind. It's kind of interesting yes. this way. It's like, it's like, it's like if we had like, like a campfire. It's like, there were, okay, there are these illegal aliens. And they come across the border with guns and narcotics. Like we're a campfire ghost story or something. You know, it's kind of fitting for what I'm talking about. Okay, I think we're gonna have to, 
That's not going to work too well, buddy. That video is not going to happen. I'm pretty sure it isn't. All right. So here's the deal. Every step of the way, while we report on the border, about a year and a half, two years ago, I started to realize some really frightening trends. I, I signed up for all of the, um, I went to the FBI website and I signed up for all of the press releases about crimes that are being prosecuted by the federal government, right? From the U.S. Attorney's Office. And when you sign up, they send you, they ask you if you want to sign up for DEA letters and for everything letters. So I signed up for the whole Shebango, every email press release put out by under the DOJ or under Homeland Security. And I began to notice a really frightening trend. I began to realize a couple of things. I began to realize that, I began to see this weird thing. This is gonna sound weird when I start talking about it, but listen to me. I began to realize that every time there was a large scale methamphetamine bust in the US, it was almost always a situation where there was a guy with a Hispanic last name who was getting 40 years. And then there was a guy with, with or a couple of people with Anglo sounding last names, English sounding last names, who were getting two and three years. And so the former leftist in me was like, is this a racial ish disparity issue? And so I began to look into it. And what I found out was it was always, the reason the one guy was getting the higher sentence was because he was the leader of the organization, right? And I began to wonder, like, why on earth is every big methamphetamine bust in the United States right now led by some guy with a Hispanic last name? And then why do they have so many people with Anglo white sounding last names like working for them? This is so weird. So I dug further and I began to find that every time one of those large scale busts happen with and the guy with the Hispanic last name gets 40 years, he's actually an illegal alien. And I began to dig deeper, and I began to find that he's actually an illegal alien who's working for the cartels. So what we have is a situation where cartels are sending their own people into the U.S. illegally across our border. They come and then they hire U.S. citizens to work for their, their organization, for their cartels. And that's people like, well, that's scary. Let me tell you some details. So in Washington State, they've had several large-scale methamphetamine busts, and again, the, the U.S. Attorney's Office finally went on record and said, yes, these are cartel operations that we are busting in our state. That's in the northeast, the northwestmost corner of the U.S. That's all the way up there. And then I began to realize that the Bakken region, how many of you have ever heard of the Bakken region? It's uh, South Dakota. We have a couple people. They're, they're doing really well right now with, 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 with oil from, from the fracking, right? From the shale oil. They're doing really well. And there's a big boom up there. Well, I began to realize that there were all these busts that were happening in and around the Bakken region. And I started digging, and guess what? It was always people with, who were illegal Mexican nationals running these operations in the Bakken region. There started to be a large increase in sex trafficking, human trafficking. There started to be a large increase in methamphetamines because the oil workers, apparently there's some oil workers can be kind of rough sometimes, right? Some oil field guys. Uh, some of you are laughing because you know what I'm talking about. Um, some of them can be kind of rough, and I guess there's an industry or a, a market for, for prostitution and narcotics amongst some of those workers. Not all of them, of course. Um, so then I began to look at Texas. How many of you are aware that we're having an oil boom right now? Yeah. So what does that mean? That means that we have cartels doing what? Providing women and narcotics in our oil boom, right? So I began to realize we have some frightening things occurring. Well, then something weird happened is I started noticing that in the southern states, like, like Alabama and, and uh, Mississippi, every time there's a large bus there, it's some guy who's a Guatemalan national. Isn't that weird? Isn't that strange that in the western U.S. it's all like Mexican nationals and in the southern states it's all Guatemalan nationals? You know what that means? That means that the, the drug organizations, the transnational criminal gangs from Central and South America, have already carved up the U.S. into their own territories. That's what it means. It's frightening, right? How many of you are aware that two months ago, two teenagers 
were duct taped to chairs and beaten, and one of them had their finger nearly severed off while tortured. How many of you heard about, you know about that? Anybody else know about that? Well, guess what? The DOJ press release didn't say it. It just said that two teenagers were tortured and a bunch of guys got in trouble. But when you dug into the court records, guess what it was? Check this out. It was a Sinaloa cartel methamphetamine house that was robbed. Someone stole, robbed it in, in St. Paul, Minnesota, all the way almost to the northern border with Canada. And the two teenagers, the two U.S. citizens, they were paying to watch the house. The Sinaloa cartel hired MS-13 gang members from Los Angeles to fly up to Minnesota and torture these kids to get the information from them. So they tortured these teenagers until the teenagers told them where their dope was or who did it or whatever. Um, that's frightening as heck to me. How many of you are aware that in 2010, how many of you ever heard of the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas, the Aryan Brotherhood, a white nationalist prison gang? How many of you are aware that in 2010, an Aryan Brotherhood member was arrested with 300 pounds of methamphetamine in Texas? 300 pounds, and he admitted that it was Gulf Cartel meth. So now we have a situation where you have the Mexican cartels hiring U.S. prison gangs to be their enforcers and their drug runners. How many of you think that's frightening? Okay, so if we ever get this video going, it like it ought to go now. We're going to watch the video and then we're going to talk a little bit about the holes in the border. And in light of what I just said, I think it might concern you a little bit. You might see where it affects your life. Can we do the video now? Shallow it is. Check it out. 
This is the only border fence between Texas and the Zetas headquarters, right here. This is it. <laughs> That's all that's here. Usually there's lookouts yeah. all along the river, so usually there are fishermen that are lookouts. You're going to see that on the U.S. side too tonight. You're going to see fishermen who are just out there in the middle of nowhere alone or somehow feel safe just to go fishing in the middle of nowhere in our tunnel. And then right over here in these bushes, right before that big berm that comes out to the lighter full of shade and you see the dirt, yeah, yeah there's a big... It's uh, smooth. It's almost like yeah. Yeah, someone's hit that one and made it. Smooth. Right. There's always a scout over there. And I've watched them before when I've been sitting out here in the view. I've watched them and a guy just like wearing like some shoes, shorts, and a t-shirt. He would just walk out and let a guy walk in. And then they would kind of sit in there. And they're watching you as well as you see the next time they come. If you go down the river just past up there, it's going to loop to the left a little bit, yeah. and then it loops a hard 90, 90 degrees okay. up to the right. That's what the river does. And so all of the area between us, or really between those tracks and, and that, that river bend, is called West Laredo. And then that will also, you'll see, you'll see tonight. So the last time we were down here, they had one Border Patrol agent stationed for all of West Laredo, even though West Laredo is the area where the narcotics come we're in a location called One River Place, just outside, eight miles outside of uh, Laredo, Texas, immediately across the river from Nuevo Laredo, which is pretty much the headquarters for the Los Zetas cartel. This area was going to be a neighborhood, and obviously it didn't get developed. But what you're going to find is there's very little security. Uh, through sources, we were able to determine that there are very few sensors in this region. As we walk close to the river, which is not very far this way, you're going to see every maybe half mile there's going to be a fisherman, right? And he's going to be out there fishing. And he fishes there every day, almost for a living, because it actually is for a living. They're scouts for the cartels. Maybe not all of them, but probably they are. And that's what we're doing out here. Uh, as we walk, you're going to find bits of clothing from illegal immigrants. As we walk, you're going to find inner tubes, uh, deflated inner tubes that smugglers have used. And you're going to see that there's absolutely nothing between us right here and between the highway that's right there and between the Zetas territory. And again, we're in the Laredo sector, one sector away from the Rio Grande Valley sector where Texas leaders and national leaders are focusing all of their law enforcement efforts. Again, my name is Hector Garza. I'm a Border Patrol agent uh, coming up on almost 14 years of working uh, in the Laredo sector area. Uh, I'm also the spokesperson for the National Border Patrol Council, uh, Local 2455. Uh, we represent about 1,700 uh, members, uh, Border Patrol agents and support staff in the Laredo area. <laughs> Unfortunately, what we see a lot is that a lot of these agents are being, uh, are being assigned to like administrative type of duties. We've seen a decline in apprehensions uh, in, in, the, in the southwest border, uh, including the Laredo Valley and the Laredo area. A lot of people think that it's because of the, the BEAST, which is a train that brings all these people from Central America to the, to the U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, it derailed in Mexico, and it's been out of service for like two weeks already. Now, I mean, it's only been about three weeks that the, uh, that the numbers have started kind of declining. Uh, obviously, the numbers are down with family units and, and, and children, but obviously the drugs are still coming and the dangerous criminals. Whenever there's been like escapes in, in prisons in Central America, and they put like a big uh, announcement to, to the agents, what happens is that we end up catching the view on the U.S. border. Now, what happens to those we don't catch? come straight up through here, another one will come down through that area, and another one will come to that area at the same time. And actually, uh, 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 the smuggling activity will occur. Uh, and it's very easy to actually smuggle people. At every part of, of, of the Mexican side, of the river on this Mexican side, uh, somebody is, is assigned to that area. So uh, we know that there are scouts that are always looking out for us. We have scouts on the, on the Mexican side, and we have scouts on the American side as well. And if you don't have the sufficient manpower, you can see how it's very easy to actually uh, have people get away. Uh, we do have a boat patrol agent here, but when we have this boat patrol agent here, there might be, there's going to be a group of 20, 30 crossing just down, down the river. Um, and this is a very busy area, and you can kind of see how the, uh, the town lends, lends itself for this type of community. Uh, there's a lot of abandoned houses uh, that they use as stash houses, and uh, uh, the law enforcement presence out here is very, is very small. Now, what we, what we know is that the, uh, these criminal organizations will exploit the communities, and, and be it uh, that they're, uh, that they're uh, volunteering to uh, actually engage in these uh, criminal activities, or be it that they're coerced by the drug cartels. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, uh, a lot of people are actually coerced and intimidated by these activities. I mean, if you live in this town uh, and there's little, little to no law enforcement presence, 
uh, you pretty much are going to uh, become a target of these uh, uh, criminal organizations. Uh, morale is low, especially when you are risking your life out there, when you're exposing yourself to the elements, and you have uh, just people, and then the government turns around and releases them into our country. So yes, morale uh, it is low. However, our agents still continue to come to work, and they still try their best, and, and, and we are very good at what we do. The way to shut down the border is having boots on the ground. As you can see, you can have an agent here with a very nice truck and a camera system, but if you don't have the boots on the ground to be able to respond, how do you stop it? Behind us is the Huevo Laredo, which is the headquarters for the Los Santos Cartel. Now this area here is between the river, which is the boundary between the U.S. and Mexico, and a neighborhood called, called the Azteca neighborhood. The Azteca neighborhood is a very low-income neighborhood and is known for smuggling. It's a major narcotics uh, uh, hub for this part of Texas. And so people come up, you can see from the footprints, People come up the river, very shallow here, and they're able to come up and wait, and the scouts tell them when the border patrol is gone, and then the people make a run for it to the neighborhood, and once they're in the neighborhood, they're kept in a series of stash houses, and law enforcement doesn't know what to do. Now, we've spoken with border patrol agents out here, um, in addition to speaking to the border patrol agents, and they told us all about it. So basically, this is an area that's controlled by the city, like a city park, right? It's called Fisherman's Landing. And as you go down that way, go west, uh, the park is just getting more and more overgrown. And there's a series of drainage tunnels. And in the drainage tunnels, people go and they use that for narco-trafficking and for, for smuggling. Law enforcement isn't allowed to catch them and go in there. So if, if law enforcement sees someone, if the Border Patrol sees someone shipping drugs or, or people, and the Border Patrol approaches them, but people simply go in the drainage tunnels and Border Patrol isn't allowed to go in there. Uh, only the fire department can go in there. That's the way the rules are set up. So basically, the entire area in Laredo, most of the area, is, is just one big, one big place for, for criminals to come in or for illegal aliens to come in and to get away with them. We're just one section over from the Rio Grande Valley sector. So the way it works, is you have the, the Gulf of Mexico, then the Rio Grande Valley sector, which is on the news a lot right now. And then right over from that, you have the Laredo sector. But interestingly, none of the National Guard are being sent here. There's no state troopers being sent here. So it's really just the Border Patrol agents out here um, in uh, insufficient numbers trying to deal with this. But the place, as you can see, is wide open. This was a big area for narcotics. Now it's kind of expanded to the people. It's slowed down a little bit. Even though we don't see anybody, you know, we still have somebody monitoring us. Um, what do we need? Better equipment. I drive a boat at night, and we have the uh, headgear, which you wear, sometimes helmets, sometimes a headgear, which is elastic, and mine's rotted out. So instead of driving like this, I have to drive like this, which means one hand on the MVG. As we drive, we can drive with MVGs and radar. But it makes it easier if we have the headgear. If we have those helmets. Um, I love DPS. I love the state of Texas. Their gear is better than ours. The rifles are better. Their their armor is better. Their headgear is better. Their boats are better. I don't know that we need six machine guns. One would be nice, but we'll probably never get it. Um, yeah, their equipment is better than ours. Lookouts everywhere. If, if you look at Ansaldos Park on the weekends, if you happen to go out or if you were around tomorrow, you'll, you'll see families who look like they're fishing, but they're on the cell phone 90% of the time. So they're calling out, hey, the boats have moved. All you have to do is move 100 yards in either direction, and you can't be seen, and there it goes. The thing is, you look for the jet skis doing a stupid move and look down the river because they're distracting you. So yeah, we have problems. Um, a lot of times they have more intel sources than we do. You know, they'll take a load out, and they may have up to 15 or 20 scouts laid all out reporting on every single thing we do. The big stuff is this. Mexicans cross over, we process them, we can send them back if they're not going to jail. If it's an OTM, an OTM is other than Mexican. I can see somebody cross a river right now, I pick them up, I process them, Mexico won't take them back because they're not Mexican citizens. Even though I could take a video of them crossing from Mexico to here, show it to them and they still wouldn't take them back. If they're coming here, if you move 50 yards up river, and by the time you get there, they're already here. 
The, the smugglers have made a cash windfall, right? Why? It's like the Cubans. All they have to do is touch the land. And as soon as they touch the land, well, at that point, we're responsible for safety, security, and, and all this. And um, the Border Patrol has done the best job out of all this because we catch the people. We, you know, our resources, we've been hampered. We have so many people babysitting or watching. When our cells were packed, we'd have, our station can hold like 300 people. We've actually held up to 1,300 almost. OTMs are probably, it depends. If they're adult OTMs without children, they're probably gonna be sent back unless they can really show that they have a, what's called a credible fear, which a, a, an asylum officer determines. If they're families, meaning a, an adult, usually a female and multiple children, they're probably gonna get to stay. They dumped a bunch of them off at the bus station today. What do you guys think? So, I have a question for you. So when our leaders come out and say, we're sending a thousand troops to the border to secure the border, and they're only talking about one sector, and the next sector over looks like that, does that offend you at all? Does it make you feel like you're not being told the whole truth? So when you say we're sending a thousand people to the border to secure the border, it's like, well, you're telling the truth, but you're, you're also being a little bit disingenuous in my opinion to put it nicely, which I'm gonna do because I'm in a church right now. I will put it nicely. So here's the deal. <clears throat> Let's talk about National Guard on the border right now. Let's have a little talk, and then I'm gonna stop talking pretty quickly and open it up for Q&A, which I will then talk longer when you ask me questions, because that's what I do. But it will be informative. But let, let's talk about the National Guard. So on the border, as it stands, there's a lot of areas where they have cameras and sensors, and they can tell when people are coming across. But the Border Patrol says that roughly one out of 10 times, sometimes in some areas like the Rio Grande Valley sector, it's 50% of the time, they're able to respond when they know that people are coming across. They don't have enough agents. So if you have a bunch of cameras, I mean, imagine this, if we have a bunch of cameras along the border and a bunch of sensors, right? and we can tell when people are coming across, and you say, hey, hey guys, someone's coming across right here. And the Border Patrol agents say, we're too busy over here, sorry. What good does that do? That doesn't do much good, does it? Okay, so now if the National Guard's gonna be on the border, and all they can do is report to the Border Patrol that they see illegal aliens coming across, I'm gonna ask you, what you've just done is you basically put a thousand human sensors on the border for a border patrol to respond to who doesn't have the resources or the manpower to respond. So if they can if they already can only respond one out of 10 times to when, the, when they know an illegal alien's crossing, what good does it do to put a thousand people out there with binoculars to tell them illegal aliens are crossing? It doesn't do any good at all, does it? What does it do? Sounds good. It sounds good. It sounds good. That's right. So with that, I'm gonna open up for Q&A, and then you're gonna let me know what kind of things are on your mind, and then I'm gonna ramble on for 10 minutes each time you ask a question. And it'll be very informative, but I can't help myself. So with that, are we doing cards? Cards today. Cards today, we're gonna to do cards. Do we already have cards? They're on the table, so just give us a minute. Okay, cool, all right, awesome. If you'll hold them up, we'll get them collected. If you have a question, write it down. Is the mic on? Well, My mic's on. As long as my mic's on, I'm happy. Come on, people. I know you've got questions. I have a question. I have questions. Well, right well, you got to write it down. you got to write it down. you got to do the process. Please. Okay, Miss Sir, go ahead, please. Recently, I saw a report where the Mexican helicopters, military helicopters, were coming across furnishing support for the cartel that was coming into New Mexico. Now, whoever yet thinks that Mexico is our ally and our friend are crazy as hell. <laughs> Thank you. They're I agree. not. They're supporting you. And I want to recall your attention. This is not new. In 1921, the first cavalry division was formed in El Paso with horses to protect our border. It's been there for a long time. And these idiots in the insane asylum where they've turned them loose in Washington, D.C., haven't got enough sense to know to protect us. Thank God for some of the National Guard. It just scared them 
But the National Guard, I was in the National Guard. I've been where they send you, but they don't give you any ammunition. <laughs> they let you sit on your rear end. It's not the National Guard's fault. If they give them a the mission, they'll do it. I'm an old infantry. My philosophy was you make contact with the enemy and you kill them. It is about time to do that. Thank you, sir. I'll tell you this, I'll tell you this much. When last night I got into a little bit about the cartels and about the way they're structured, what I can tell you is this, is that it is very common that Mexican military uh, comes across our border. Our border is not secure. When you're in Arizona, for instance, there are areas in Arizona where there is not even a fence, there's just a, a welded bunch of beams and so forth. Like It looks almost like a, like a Somebody put up a Normandy barrier, but forgot to go back and do the rest of it, you know? Basically, right, railroad tracks welded together. In some places as well, there's all kinds of, like in the Buenos Aires Park, there's some well, railroad track, um, but then there's also just like scraps of all kinds of stuff. Well, it's weird, but it's really easy to walk across it. There's no law enforcement there. Um, Mexican military members routinely come across our border in Arizona, for sure. Uh, probably some in New Mexico, but they routinely come across our border. That's not, that's not a conspiracy, that's, a, that's acknowledged. We've written about it tons of times. You're absolutely right, it's absolutely offensive. And uh, a couple of months ago, they came across our border and when they ran into a border patrol agent, they opened fire on the border patrol agent. And, um, and it wasn't until backup arrived, I think 45 minutes later, that the, the Mexican military members surrendered and then the Obama administration let them walk back across. However, if you venture into Mexico with a gun accidentally, you go to prison. So I mean, that's something we're dealing with, but, but the facts of the matter are that you're, what you're saying is 100% accurate, sir. Ready? Um, yeah, yes, ma'am. How's my mic? To, I, I, I love questions. I love Q&A, by the way. What is the drug money funding? Is it the black budget? What do I think that, okay, are we gonna, are we getting, are someone asking me if, if it's a situation like in the 80s with the Contras and if, no, I don't think so. I think that the drug money funds the, the drug organizations. I think that now that they've seen a decrease in profits, uh, they've turned towards human trafficking and human smuggling and uh, to replace their profits. I mean, this is some big serious money when you have, if you figure you have, just do the math in your head with all the tens of thousands of people coming across, all making, charging, charging them somewhere between 2,500 and 8,000 each, you're making some serious money moving people. Now it would seem, and I'm gonna get into, I know I'm off the subject here. I can't say whether or not there's some CIA operative making money from narcotics. I can't really answer that because I don't have that answer. But what I can tell you is this, it would seem like it's very um, counterproductive to a, a drug cartel to send a bunch of kids across our border and use that because it brings our attention to the border, right? And it makes us want a more secure border. So it would seem like they wouldn't do that. But in order to understand it, you have to understand the different drug cartels. The, the, some of them aren't even cartels anymore, really. Under California, most of Arizona, you have the Sinaloa cartel. And the Sinaloa cartel, the way this, but here's the basic rundown on what a cartel is. Um, in the 80s, there was three guys who started the Guadalajara cartel, right? The Guadalajara cartel was the cartel in Mexico. They were the ones who worked with the Colombians and brought dope into the United States. That's it. They worked with the Colombians. Well, then they got the bright idea that they could manufacture methamphetamine and have their own narcotics. And they could use the, the same shipments they were bringing in to bring their own drugs in. So they began to build power. As they built power, the US government infiltrated them. One of our DEA agents um, uh, had infiltrated them very sufficiently and did an $8 billion bust. They burned down $8 billion worth of, of marijuana fields. Well, that made the Guadalajara cartel mad, so the Guadalajara cartel killed him. And they didn't just kill him, they killed him, and then they, had, they tortured him, and they had surgeons and doctors on, on, stand, uh, on standby to keep him alive so they could torture him more. That's how brutal they were. Well, the US government reacted intensely. It put a 100% um, check rate on all of, the, all of the shipments, all of the, any goods coming from Mexico. 
Every shipment was checked every, until the, they did something about these killers. The Mexican government did it and accidentally they let him go uh, this year. They accidentally let the killer go this year. Accidentally. And now they can't find him, they say, and we can't either. Um, but here's what happened. So as the government crashed in on him because of our pressure, um, and as the U.S. government crashed in on them, they decided they were going to divide their territories up uh, so that it could be run by different people so that it would, the whole organization wouldn't suffer as if one of them was killed or arrested. When they did that, and then the big leaders went away, those organizations started fighting each other. Um, as those organizations started fighting each other, uh, they began to try to find unique ways, like the Gulf Cartel, for instance, began to try to find a unique way to deal with the Sinaloa cartel. So they, they hired a bunch of, they purchased or bribed a bunch of special forces guys from the Mexican military who were trained, some of them actually by us in Georgia, but they were trained, some of them by Israel, but they were these highly trained guys to deal with the cartels and the narcotics trade. And then they, it would be like if our Navy SEALs all quit and went to work for a cartel. We have a problem, right? That's what happened, and they became this, was they broke away, they became the Zetas. As those defenders broke away from the Gulf Cartel, they became their own cartel. So we, of course, stepped up our efforts. Of course, the Mexican government sometimes stepped up their efforts whenever they had to, and against the leadership of the cartels. And what you're left with is you're left with the Sinaloa cartel, which is still really a cartel. They're, a lot of them are businessmen, they think about long term, I mean they'll chop your head off if you write about them or if you offend them, but they still think about the long term consequences. So when, so they don't want, for instance, if, if one of their cartel guys shot me while I was out there reporting and I was on US soil, the cartel guy who shot me would probably get killed too because he would have done what? He would have brought attention to the border and he would have brought law enforcement to the border which affects the long term profits of the cartel. Sinaloa, that's one thing. They kind of resemble an Italian mob in that regard, right? As far as their long-term strategy. But as you move east and you get to where we are in Tamaulipas, which is immediately south of the Rio Grande Valley sector, which is immediately south of Texas, right? Um, you have the Gulf Cartel. Now the Gulf Cartel, all of their leaders have been killed or arrested. Now, the leaders oversaw regional managers who oversaw city managers who oversaw neighborhood managers, right? So when you removed the leaders and you removed all of the managers and now you're left with a few city managers, a bunch of neighborhood managers, and some of them have been killed, you have 20 or 30 different groups of gangs who are fighting each other. So instead of having some 40 or 50 year old seasoned guy who's thinking about his long-term profits, uh, running that organization south of Texas, now you have um, the equivalent of 15 to 22 year old uh, guys in armored vehicles with lots of money and lots of guns, lots of influence, but they're gangbangers. These are not, the, these, are, these more resemble the gangbangers we see fighting each other in East LA and not, not the Italian mob. So that's where the problem comes in with, with what we're dealing with is now with the Gulf Cartel, they don't care about the long, these guys don't care about long-term interests, they're gangbangers. They want to make money right now, they want to have women right now, they want to have nice things right now, and they're ruthless and they'll do whatever they have to do. With that said, why then would they do something that damages their long-term profits as far as bringing in tens of thousands of kids and be beginning to pressure and encourage people to come? Why would they do that? Well, they would do that because it it, they don't care about the long term. They just want the money now. And so that's a problem we have also. Would the Sinaloa cartel knowingly allow a, a terrorist to come across the southwest border, knowing that when the terrorist does an action, it would shut down the border for a while, and they would have no money? Of course they wouldn't do that. No, that would be completely against their interests. Um, and liberals, when they go on TV and say that, they're 100% correct. That would be completely against that cartel's interests. But the Gulf cartel? who is thinking about today only, why wouldn't they do that? They don't care about the long term. They know they're gonna die soon. And they know some other young guy is gonna take over their position. So that's the problem. That's what, when we talk about, like you had said about incursions, and it's so important when you talk about the border that you have the right information. You know, people put out hyperbolic reports all the time and it makes me really mad because I spend my time and my resources and my company's resources and when I spend my company's resources, let's be clear what I'm spending, right? I have a dead friend named Andrew Breitbart 
and I am trusted with resources that belong to his wife and children to do, you know, so if I spend money from this company, it really matters to me because he changed my life, right? I owe him greatly. And so it matters to me that I spend resources wisely, but still we spend resources to go and get facts. We want factual, provable information. When we know something, we prove it. And if we can't prove it, we don't say it to you. And it really bothers me when people report on this issue and they use hyperbole or they, they make stuff up. You know, there was a report recently, and if some of you were there, I'm sorry, I'm gonna make you mad, but there was a report that came out that this, the, the border tour, got, the guys on the border tour had to get evacuated from a, com from a comfort inn in, um, what city was it? It was, uh, I was just there, um, right outside of El Paso, about, um, outside of Pecos, just Fort, Fort Horn or Fort, was it? Fort, no, it was, it was not Fort Stockton, something, Van Horn, Van Horn. And so I looked at that and I was like, okay, so you're that far from the border and the cartels were gonna kill a hundred of you in a hotel in a Comfort Inn in Van Horn. And then I thought about it and I was like, you know, there's not even a Comfort Inn in Van Horn. You know, now how do you think that made me feel? Because when that happens, all the mainstream media that we're chipping away on and fighting against, they don't talk about the legitimate things I do. What do they do? They use that to say right-wingers, crazy tea partiers, making up stuff on the border. You know, that's what they use. And so do I think that a cartel threat was it? No, I don't believe that at all, that the cartels felt threatened by these hundred people who weren't even, who were like a hundred miles from the border on their border tour. That's not, how is that threatening? What does that do? What good does that do to our movement or to our country? Nothing. So when we spend resources to, to really get facts about what's going on, we take it very personally when people don't spend resources and then spew a bunch of bull and, um, and damage our movement and damage our efforts to tell you the facts. So the facts are, when, when liberals get on media and they say, they say, well, that's not in the cartel's long-term interest. Well, they, they're forgetting to tell you that some of the cartels don't care about long-term interests any longer. Right, next question, please. I told you I'd ramble. Do you believe that if we legitimize all drugs, it would kill the drug cartels? No, not at all. In fact, I'm glad that question came up. I'm gonna tell you why. And I don't believe it, neither does the United Nations. So you have way radical leftists saying the same thing that I'm saying. Um, I don't believe it. In 2012, uh, I brought this up last night too, there was the, the, the 2012 United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime report on Central America and the Caribbean. How's that for a headline? That's really long, huh? Anyways, the United Nations acknowledged that as the profits have decreased over marijuana and cocaine for the Mexican drug cartels, they have shifted their energies into human trafficking and sex trafficking of, of young girls. So, and of illegal immigrants in general. So what you have is a situation where as we decriminalize marijuana and other narcotics, the profits go down, so then we're gonna see an increase in people showing up on our southern border. See how this works? You see how it works? So when people talk about the high cost of the drug war, they're not acknowledging the high cost of ending the drug war, right? So as a person who has worked undercover with the FBI on, on human trafficking issues, let me tell you something. Most of the people who get busted on human trafficking issues, you know, for sex trafficking little girls, you know how hard that is to prove that? Do you have any idea how many resource, resources have to go in to, 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 to proving that somebody was sex trafficking women? It's really hard to do. Very, very hard to do. So what do you do when you're undercover? You catch them with the gun and cocaine. So they, they're in prison for 20 years. That's what you do. The drug war, without the drug war, how would you possibly, would, how would you possibly stop the sex trafficking in our country? And the human, you can't. That's the problem. There's not enough resources in this nation to, to do that effectively if you don't have the collateral issues to bust people on because those investigations are much cheaper, much easier, much simpler to do. That's just the fact of it. So, so my, my feelings on the drug war, do, do, you know, do, I, do I like that people are incarcerated for smoking a joint? No, I think that's kind of a ridiculous waste of resources. At the same time, I acknowledge that, that the cost of ending the drug war 
are not only financially very high, but they're also, in terms of, of humanity and human rights and the dignity and decency of people in Central America and Mexico and the dignity and decency of young women who would otherwise be raped, I think the costs are very high to them. Uh, next question. Did I answer that sufficiently? Do you think California, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas need to use their own state guard to secure their borders? Well, well that's funny you would ask me that. I think that um, the state of Texas in particular needs to do a whole bunch more for itself. You know, I'd rather see the Texas Rangers doing uh, public integrity investigations rather than the FBI. I think that's our responsibility. But we atrophy, our law enforcement agencies atrophy because uh, we're not carrying our load. We're having the federal government carry our load. Um, that's, that's because of faults of both politi politicians on both parties. Um, what do I think that needs to happen? I ultimately think that the state of Texas should secure its own border because the federal government isn't going to do so. Um, that's what I think. The legality of that, I don't know. I think that, you know, Joanne has a lot to say about the legality of that. Um, apparently there are some provisions that we maybe could do that, but by doing that, we're gonna in see an increase in the DOJ investigations into our politicians, into our Texas leaders. I mean, look what they did to Sheriff Arpaio, you know? I don't think Arpaio's perfect, and, but I do think that he's a sheriff who's elected by the people of his county, and he now has the federal government being a nanny. He has a nanny now. He has to basically get approval from his federal government nanny before he takes any action to make sure he's not violating the civil rights of people. And I think that that's absurd. You know, I could see some situations like in the 50s and 60s where that happened where I could be glad that the federal government stepped in on some counties, you know? Uh, we talked about the death of Emmett Till, or you know, you start going to the civil rights era. But I don't think because the sheriff is, 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 is uh, busting illegal immigrants, I don't think that that's fair that, that that's happening. So ultimately, I, we're either gonna have to do something about it or, um, or it's not gonna happen. You know, one of the things that I talked about last night, and I, like I said, I'm not Alex Jones, I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, and I'm not gonna say it because it's not factual. I can't prove it. But what I can prove is this. I can look at the facts and tell you that Wendy Davis was a big abysmal failure, right? I think that that, um, that momentum was a big failure. The Democrats did not properly utilize that momentum. And then they have Battleground Texas, right? The Battleground Texas, was that a big winner? I don't think so. I don't think so at all. But let me tell you something. Well, they haven't been a big winner yet, and Wendy Davis isn't a big winner. But let me tell you something. When it comes to this influx, what are, what's gonna happen here? Let's look down the road and be realistic with each other, okay? Let's look at what's happening. We have tens of thousands of illegal immigrants coming into the United States and being encouraged to. We released another uh, uh, secret report and it showed that 99.9% .9 of OTM illegal aliens, other than Mexicans, they come because they believe that they're going to be allowed to stay. That doesn't mean that the conditions in their countries aren't horrible, of course they are. But the reason they come, the majority of them said that the reason they come is because they're allowed to stay. There is a, in 2013, 1.3, I believe, 1.3% of, um, of uh, illegal immigrants were, who came from OTMs were deported. In 2014, I believe it got down to point, it was 0.1%. Point one. That means that 99.9% .9 of all of the illegal aliens coming from third, from non-contiguous nations uh, are successfully coming here, migrating, and most of them coming through Texas. So let's talk about this. What's gonna happen here? We have tens of thousands, right? Tens of thousands. We have, have roughly, in the state of Texas, it will be tens of thousands. We don't know where everyone is, and where the federal government's gonna put everyone, but the vast majority stay in Texas. So they're in Texas now. We're mad because of the violation of the rule of law, right? Which is what we're mad about. And who, when the president does, does his executive amnesty, which he'll probably do, he threatens to do it, who are gonna be the ones who help these people? Oh wait, there's already this like, there's already this, this network established in all of the counties called Battleground Texas. 
You know, what networks are they going to use to help integrate these people into U.S. society? That's who they're going to use. It'll be the same people, the same volunteers from Battleground, Texas, volunteering to introduce these people to U.S. society. So who's going to influence their politics? How are they going to vote? You know, so did Battleground Texas turn Texas blue? No. Did Wendy Davis? No. Did all that outside money? No. Will this? Yeah, I think it will. I think it will. I can't say that they're allowing it to happen because of that, because then I would be Alex Jones. I have no facts to prove that. But I can tell you that when it, we talk about their motivation and not doing something about it, I mean, it's the only way they're ever going to win. Next question. To what extent are the Border Patrol agents skittish now because of the unjust prosecution of agents Campion and Ramos in 2009? 100%. It's not just their unjust prosecution. Like, like let's talk about what happened last year when the ACLU, uh, a number of groups working with the ACLU, worked with a group called the Executive Police Research Forum. Doesn't that sound so official? Like you want to listen to them, right? They sound like they know what they're talking about. And they started this campaign to stop agents from being allowed to use deadly force when they were attacked with rocks or with vehicles. Because if you're, if you're a cop in a city and someone throws a rock at you, you're not allowed to shoot them, you know? And you can't because you can what? You can get on the, your standard, your procedures are you get on the radio and you have 100 other cops show up, right? But when you're a Border Patrol agent and your nearest backup is 45 minutes away, sometimes 90 minutes, that's the, the, the 90 minutes away is the, um, I think that's the, the, the final cutoff for how far Border Patrol agents can be from their backup. When you're out there and your radios don't work, how many of you think it's fair that Border Patrol agents should then operate under the same standards and procedures that cops in a big, like New York City would operate under? It's a completely different set of circumstances. But the ACLU and the police research, the National Police Research Executive Forum or whatever it is, they, um, they put out this big campaign and all the media supported it. And the president gave them audience and invited them into the White House to meet with them. Uh, our president, Barack Obama, or the president, Barack Obama, I mean, the president. He um, gave them attention. And their argument was that the Border Patrol is substandard and they should have to live up to the same standards of excellency, excellency as other large metropolitan, other large police forces. But do you see where that was skewed? So what we then did is we released photos, somebody leaked them to us, I'm not going to tell you who, but it was someone who wears a green uniform in the Border Patrol. Um, they leaked to us the images, the internal images of all of the Border Patrol agents when they first got attacked and when they were getting treatment. And you saw their occipital bones broken, their faces caved in, their heads caved in. These weren't people, little kids, throwing little stones at people. These were smugglers sitting up on cliffs, dropping giant boulders and rocks and flagstones on the heads of Border Patrol agents. And they're supposed to not use force back. So let's do the math here. If you are a Democrat, or if you're the president, and you try to push a narrative where Border Patrol agents are not allowed to shoot back and defend themselves, right? Now catch this, check this out. And it's a situation where they're oftentimes nine, up to 90 minutes away from backup, and their radios don't work, so they're out there alone, radio doesn't work, and they're not allowed to defend themselves. What's going to happen? They're not going to go out there. So there'll be these huge areas that are not, not paroled, not patrolled, I mean. Huge areas that there's no enforcement, which there already is, but there'll be even larger areas, right? Now, why would you do that as the President of the United States? Unless you wanted, why would, why would anyone in leadership do that? So when we talk about the agents getting attacked, the agents getting prosecuted, it's the same exact thing with this. It's, there's a, there, I believe there is a war against the Border Patrol led by the left establishment. And the war against the Border Patrol serves one purpose, and that is to weaken them, that is to take their strength away, and to, to make them not want to enforce our law. That's what I believe is occurring. I think I have factual, I have high evidentiary standards, and I believe that they are being applied to that, that, that um, statement. And um, I think that the prosecution, I think that trying to get them not to respond with force 
I think that having the majority of them, like in the Laredo sector, there was a point several months ago where 70% of them, according to them, 70% of them were taken off of the border and they were put taking care of unaccompanied minors. So you'd have a guy out there alone on a 10 mile stretch of border and he'd get a call and they would say, hey, we need you to come and take this family unit to the hospital, they have a cold. And he's like, are you kidding me? And he would have to do it. So what the result was is, there, listen to this, there were roughly 20 zones within the Laredo sector, right, zones. And half of the zones didn't have an agent in it anymore. So what did the Border Patrol agency do? Not the agents, but the agency. Now there's four zones. And they report back, no, we're okay. We have 100% of our zones covered now. You see what we're dealing with? Do you see what we're dealing with? How many of you looked at Breitbart, Texas today? Just be honest, be honest. That's upsetting, okay, that's better. I would have really been upset if you didn't. You should go to Breitbart, Texas every day. You looked at it today. Did you see the TSA story? Okay, listen to this. The Border Patrol agents from the Laredo sector called me and they said, Brandon, we have a problem. The TSA is allowing these illegal immigrants to fly with the notice to appear forms. How many of you know what that is? It's, they get arrested, they get processed, then they say, what is your name? Your name is so-and-so, how old are you? Okay, where are you from? Okay, okay, here is your notice to appear. You know, you have to come back in X number of days to an immigration judge. But in the meantime, we're gonna send you to Illinois if that's where you wanna go, because that's where your family is. So they give them a notice to appear form, and the TSA was allowing people to fly with the notice to appear forms. So anyone could come from anywhere and say they were anyone from anywhere and get on a plane with a notice to appear for them. And we wrote about it. And do you know what happened? The TSA publicly called me a liar. They mocked me. They made fun of me. They sent like 15 or 20 tweets on social media making fun of me, calling me a liar. And I stood by my story. I, I stood by my story intensely and the Border Patrol agent stood and they kept calling us liars on social media and putting out statements. And the Border Patrol agent said, we have 22, 23 federal agents, federal law enforcement officers, who are willing to give sworn statements that the TSA is lying, that they did indeed allow these aliens to fly with notice to appear forms. We are willing to go before Congress and testify under oath before Congress that they are lying, that they're allowing illegal aliens to fly with notice to appear forms. And the TSA still said what? You're a liar. And then guess what we just released today? A letter from the TSA where they admit that they were allowing illegal aliens to fly with notice to appear for them. Now, how do you think that feels as a journalist to, when the federal government starts mocking you? They didn't just say you're incorrect. I mean, they sent me 15 tweets making fun of me for being a liar. It was a smear campaign. A smear campaign for telling the truth. The next question. This is a statement, and unfortunately, I'm going to have to put a disclaimer in front of it because too many people in this room know me. This is not me. It's easy to cross from Mexico into the Big Bend sector. Just swim the river in, I think it's Bogalas Canyon. I've done it a lot at age 58, six years ago. Folks, it wasn't me. So Let's see. Pointing out that it was easy to do. Right, it's easy to do everywhere. There's an area called Fort, not Fort Stockton, Fort Hancock. It's about, what, 40, 50 miles east of El Paso. It's in the El Paso sector. You wanna hear something really weird when you go there? I go there, I'm one mile from the interstate, right? I can see the interstate right there. And I'm in this field, and I look at this, chain, this barbed wire fence, and at that section, because the Rio Grande's water is diverted, the river, the, the international boundary between the U.S. and Mexico is a four foot wide, two or three foot deep water trough. And then there's a, there's a barbed wire fence right there. And that is the border. I was there for 40 something minutes before a border patrol agent showed up. And I'm that close to the freeway. That's crazy, right? So when we talk about the Big Bend sector, um, the agents from the Big Bend sector have invited me to come and tour their sector. So I'm going to go tour their sector with them in the coming weeks, and I will talk about that sector. But I have no doubt in my mind that it is just as wide open as, as I've seen in other places. One thing I do know about the Big Bend sector is they opened the first 
remote controlled, um, remotely operated immigra or immigration checkpoint or a border checkpoint. So there's a place you go and there's a little camera and you go up to it and you push the button and you're like, who are you? I'm so-and-so here. Okay, cool. And the gate opens. Yeah, I'm not joking. So yeah, so th this is the way it works out, guys. You have the CBP, right? You have Customs and Border Protection. And under the media, it can get things wrong. But my, my suggestion is that you tell people what's going on. You, you hold your leaders accountable. When they get up there and they say, the border's gonna get secure, we're gonna, you know, somebody, and this is so mean of me, I know, but Congressman Burgess, well, that is it, Congressman Burgess. Okay, now listen to those people. I was on the Arizona border, and I had to speak. And I got a chance to speak in Dallas. Uh, with the, it was Julie and a bunch of other people. And there was a theater, it was a really beautiful situation. So I drove 13 hours to get there, right? Now that's nothing compared to what these Border Patrol agents from Laredo, the one you saw in the thing here, Hector and then his, I guess his boss, his vice president, uh, Jared uh, Seeley, they worked all night, okay? They did the night shift. They got off at eight or, nine, eight or nine in the morning and then they went from Laredo all the way to Dallas to speak that night just to tell people what's going on on the border, which, by the way, they're in trouble for doing. Um, they did it on their day off, right? The one day off they have with their family, they did that. So we're there about to talk, and this congressman shows up, and no offense to the congressman, I'm sure I ruffled some feathers, but he shows up and he wants to get on stage before us, and he talks for five minutes, and he, was, he basically said, you know, he said, he was like, God bless Perry for shutting down the border, and he has the cartels on the run. And everyone's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, that's not true. You're lying. You're, you're either very ignorant or you're very dishonest. So I promise you I did not want to be ugly. I'm not an ugly person to people. But when I got on the stage, I got up and I said, where is Congressman Burgess? And they said, he left. So he basically used my event with the Border Patrol agents as a photo op, which made me mad. And he said things that weren't true, so I had to call him out. And that's not comfortable. Like right now, I think our governor is under a big attack. Some people think it's justified, some don't. I'm concerned about the, the, the indictment of our political leaders like this, very concerned about it. The last thing I want to do is be critical of Governor Perry right now. But if, if you go around saying stuff that isn't accurate about the border, my loyalty to the men and women of law enforcement is going to outweigh my my sense of loyalty to my governor, sorry. My loyalty to the men and women of law enforcement is gonna outweigh my loyalty to a governor who's shutting down the border after 12 years of being in office, right? So again, again, like let's be real straight here and then I'll, I'll get off. I was on the left. I saw bad things. I went undercover with law enforcement. I helped them bust in bad things and stop bad people both violence against U.S. citizens and violence against Israeli citizens. I'm very proud to have done that and had a part in that with the men and women of law enforcement. When my name came out and I testified, I got attacked, I got destroyed by left media. Mainstream media destroyed my career. They tried to ruin me. They tried to attack me and make sure that, that they had an agenda that they wanted to defend and they did everything they could to support it. And Andrew Breitbart found me and he said, hey, I'm gonna help you. And he kept his promises, he made me whole, and he gave me a voice, and I've used that voice to defend the men and women of law enforcement. He went around this country, well, I'll tell you, it's the least I could do. He went around this country and he asked Tea Party groups to support me, to hear my story, and to support what I was trying to do. And for the most part, Tea Party groups have done that. Across the whole country they have. So now I'm telling you, he did that because he hated bullies. He, when he saw people who were trying to do the right thing or who did something important that was vital and other people were attacking them for it and destroying their character and smearing them, he cared and he wanted to defend me because that's what he did. That's why he defended you people. He defended you because you were being called slope-headed and racist. Remember that? T potential Timothy McVeigh's. And he couldn't stand that you were average Americans who work every day, who are just trying to get involved in the political process, and you were being destroyed for it, okay? When I started going down at the border, when I started going down there, I started to see the Border Patrol agents like Andrew saw me and like Andrew saw you. That's how I started to see them. They were being destroyed for doing the right thing, given no quarter, 
being decapitated in media and in public opinion. And so I'm coming to you and I'm telling you, you have to support those people. You have to support the men and women of Border Patrol and the law enforcement on the border. They're being attacked, they're being destroyed. How many of you saw the Vickers, even on his ranch, how many of you saw that he got attacked and destroyed in media? Anything that results in less potential Democratic voters coming into Texas and the United States, anything that stands in the way of that is going to get attacked. And unless every one of you start doing something about it, telling people about it, leaving comments, you think leaving comments on a story doesn't matter? But when I used to read those horrible stories about me that my mother had to read and my daughter will probably someday read that were completely untrue, attacking me in law enforcement for stopping a bomb plot as they defended these guys who were made bombs to kill Republicans and cops in 2008 at the RNC, when I had to read those horrible things about me, it was that one comment with somebody supporting me that got me through a day. Even if all you do every day is find a bad story about Border Patrol and interject fact or interject the comment supporting them or pointing out the facts, you're doing something. Do something about them. You know, we can talk all day about securing the border, but here is how you do it, okay? You do it in these little minute ways. You do it by going around and telling people and informing people. You do it by showing up down there with the camera, or if I show up down there with the camera, it doesn't, nobody's charging for all these reporting, just go share it with people. Copy the video link and share it with people. Inform people, talk back. Thank you. left a huge um, pile of my cards over there. I'm going to ask you, please don't call me unless you absolutely have to. But I have an email. But it's all over there. And uh, y'all can get a hold of me if you ever really need to. If you ever need help or if you ever know of people in a bad spot, I'm pretty good at figuring out solutions with my team. Thank you. I would first of all ask you all to please join me and keep Brandon Darby in your prayers. Uh, I believe that when the history is written about this period in our country, Brandon Darby will be known as a patriot. <laughs> now, if you're new here and you don't know how to stay in touch with what we're doing, I can tell you that we're going to continue this fight about the border. Next week's uh, program is going to be about terrorism from a terrorism expert who is going to come in uh, and he's going to speak with us on that. Uh, these cards are over there on the table and they have our contact information at the bottom. Uh, you can go to the website and you can see our calendar of events. Now, real quickly, why have we spent all the time lately establishing the baseline about why people need to care about this is because we're about to present a solution. And the solution is going to cause a lot of fireworks, I guarantee you. So uh, I want you all to come back next week, and I want you to come whenever I present what our solution is going to be, because that solution is going to be presented down at the Capitol. And I want you all to understand it so that you can talk to people about it. Now. Uh, our good friend here from the Edom Tea Party is going to tell you about an event they have. Thank you, Joanne. I won't keep you long. Uh, I'm going to send the link to Joanne Grassroots, and she can send it out to you. How many people heard about the Ben Wheeler pasture party that uh, went to viral? About uh, the kids got on social media, and there were five thousand of them showed up in June to a pasture party in Ben Wheeler. It uh, ended up nothing but an alcohol, drug-infested uh, gathering. It incensed me and a lot of people in my community. And I just met uh, yesterday morning with about 12 ministers from Van Zandt County, uh, Henderson County, and Smith County. And we are having a Ben Wheeler pasture party. This is a positive event. I'm looking out here and I can look at myself and see just a bunch of old people. <laughs> we need to activate our young people and this is our outreach to it. We have some fantastic entertainment, the number 
one duo of the Christian country music world. They're uh, there to Christian country like Brooks and Dunn is uh, to CMA. They're the main headliners. We have some local um, entertainers that are coming. Dan Cummins is flying in from DC just to be a part of this. And we're so excited because last night, Austin Lux uh, practiced his <laughs> presentation at our tea party meeting and it was a standing ovation as usual. And he's gonna be there. He's gonna be our main speaker to reach out to the youth. We expect possibly at least a thousand. We hope we have the 5,000 that this previous pastor party turned up. If you want to learn about it, I know uh, Channel 56 was here, but Channel 7 did the news report on the pastor party. Google uh, KLTV and look up Pastor Party and they'll explain it all to you. But uh, you'll be getting information. I have some handouts back here. It's going to happen uh, September the 6th. Take these flyers to your church. Give it to your youth ministers. Get these kids out there to this. They're going to have a positive uh, outlook after they've attended this. Thank you very much. Doc Collins, Dwayne Collins, he's the leader of the Edom Tea Party. Um, okay, everybody, uh, thank you for coming out today. We're going to need help putting the tables up. So the group of people that help putting the CBP, you have the Office of, op, of Field Operations, whatever, and then you have the Office of Border Patrol. And um, the agency itself is, is strongly controlled by, by, politically, by political appointees of Barack Obama. Um, not the agency that the CBP is. Uh, the Border Patrol, some, a lot of the leaders of Border Patrol are actually really good people. But um, I don't think that's the case in the CBP. Next question. Or okay, statement. I've been told one more question, so please don't get upset. I've just tried to pick out. Can we do two more if I promise to answer quickly? <laughs> yes. Okay, two more questions. Okay. It seems reasonable to issue an order to halt and it is not complied with to shoot. Is that not law enforcement? Why is the National Guard not able to be the enforcers of the Border Patrol, the pointers? I, I get, I get a, the gist of that. So I'm not a person who's in favor of shooting people, um, and I'll tell you why. I think if we just enforced our current laws, I think that it would be, it would be sufficient to detour people from coming. And then the only people who did come probably would be people who had bad intentions. And, uh, but I don't think it's ever a good idea um, to just openly shoot people because you see them crossing a river. Uh, North Korea does that, and a couple of people do that in the world, but most places don't, and I don't think we should either. I also think that you're not gonna have any political support behind you for anything if, if your call is to shoot people. I think doing fences in most places and increasing the number of agents, uh, beginning to enforce our immigration laws, I think that those would be sufficient. Um, and probably holding businesses accountable for their hiring actions, which people on the right a lot of times say they don't want to do. Well, if you don't, you're not going to ever solve the problem. But yeah, I'm not, I'm not a shooting people fan. Um, People ask me that a lot about militias too. They're like, what about we're gonna go down there with guns? And I'm like, well, you can do that, but all you're gonna do is piss off the law enforcement who's already under attack from Barack Obama, his administration. Because they, that makes it very confusing to them when there's people with a bunch of people walking around with guns. They don't know who the hell you are. You know, they don't know what you are, who you are. So I always say that my video camera does a lot more good on the border than my gun does. You know? Now I say that until I get under fire and then I'm going to be like, I usually have a gun with me, but I don't, I, I tone it down. Like when I go to Arizona, I'm not wearing camos, I'm not eating MREs, there's a McDonald's five miles away. You know, if you want to have some nostalgic experience and, and play a part, then go down there and eat MREs and do whatever. But that's not really, the, 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 better, the better thing we can do right now as citizens, I think, as civilians, the better thing that we can do is to go down there, make sure you can protect yourself, don't overdo it, don't go down there with like a 50 caliber, you know, and, um, and bring your video cameras and tell people so you know, so you have information. The facts are the facts and the facts are beneficial to us, right? We just have to know them and say them and make sure that we call out people who say things that aren't true. Next one, and that's the last one, I promise. What happens to the money after a bust of the cartel? Can it be given to the Border Patrol to buy equipment? 
Can a charitable organization be set up through Britbart to fund equipment for the Border Patrol since our government won't do it? My, the better question would be, can a charitable organization be set up through Joanne? <laughs> and I think she's shaking her head. It can. Whether or not they would allow us to give that, in, that to them, I don't know. 